Welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. And tonight, I went around the world to bring you a guest. I'm in Rome. In fact, I'm in the palace of the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre. But it's a palace that used to belong to Pope Paul III and his family. This building goes back to the 1400s, well before I was born. And we are here with Cardinal Fernando Filoni, who is, at this point, the cardinal in charge of the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre. And we want to speak about his new book called The House Was Filled with the Fragrance of the Perfume. And that this book is uh, something that is not only a, about rules, in fact, it's not about the rules and regulations of the Knights. It's about the depths of the spiritual life needed to be a Knight of the Holy Sepulchre and a kind of spirituality that any one of us would be able to benefit from. So, Your Eminence, welcome. It is very nice to be with you. We don't have you on our stage, but we're on yours, and we appreciate you opening up the Palace of the Knights for us to uh, meet with you and have this interview. Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah. thank you. Now, first of all, your background is, is, as a priest and a bishop working in the church has been in the diplomatic core. You worked as a church diplomat. Number of countries, correct? Yes, I started as an assistant parish priest for uh, almost 10 years uh -huh. in Rome. I was studying at the same time I was uh, uh, working with the young people in the schools. Mm -hmm. Then uh, when uh, I was to go back to my diocese in the south of Italy, the Holy See told me that we need somebody also for the diplomatic service of the Holy See. Who would you like to join? I said, well, I am not so sure. I have to ask my bishop. The bishop said yes. So for 40 years, I served also yes. the Holy See. And uh, I remember my first appointment was in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was uh, also a difficult moment because at that time started the war between Singhalese and the Tamils, mm -hmm. which affected the country for many years. Yes, it was a bitter so, war. So it was a very pitiful moment uh, for all of us, and, and we too. We too, I remember, a very difficult moment. Then, uh, because uh, my <laughs> experience for war, I was sent in another war in Iran. Mm -hmm. At the time, it was a Khomeini time, and it was the war between Iraq and Iran. Yes. So I had an experience for two years in that, that country. Then I was uh, coming back to Rome, called to work uh, in the Secretary of State. It was the beginning of my service to the Holy See. Then, uh, uh, I have been in many other parts. I was in Brazil, I was in, uh, in China for nine years. I served at the beginning of this opening up of, of the, of the uh, regime, mm -hmm. uh, Beijing regime. Uh, at the time, uh, Hong Kong was uh, for four years uh, uh, still under British rule. And afterwards, I was under Chinese Beijing rule. So I saw the beginning of the church, uh, resurging church in this land. Then uh, I was sent as apostolic nuncio in Jordan and Iraq. So I was there during the period 
There are periods of Saddam Hussein, then the war, and after the war. Mm -hmm. Before, uh, in, uh, in 2006, uh, before uh, uh, be sent to the Philippines, then uh, Pope Benedict called me after one year there to become substitute of the Secretary of State here in Rome. And uh, after four years, uh, he asked me to join as a prefect of the Congregation for the Evangelization of People. It means the missionary dicastery of the Holy See. So for nine years, I served there before being appointed by Pope Francis as a Grand Master of the Disorder. In the order of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, is not known to everybody. Uh, it's an order, uh, the Holy Sepulchre, of course, refers to the church that includes Mount Calvary and the tomb of Jesus. They're very close to each yes. other. Yes, yes. And this is a church shared by Catholics, Greek Orthodox, Armenians, there are Coptic Christians, Coptic Orthodox, there are also the Ethiopians. Lots of communities yes. have shared this church that is the very core of Christianity. Without the cross and the resurrection, Christianity is a mere philosophy maybe a morality, nothing more. But the cross and the resurrection, the Calvary and the empty tomb of Jesus Christ are at the center. And the order of the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre began when? Well, uh, uh, historically, it's very difficult to say any when. Uh, many are thinking that in some way we go back, back to the Crusade period. Mm -hmm. But historically, the, in the uh, 15th, 16th century, mm -hmm. we have uh, documents. Mm -hmm. Certainly, at the beginning, uh, near the Holy Sepulchre, the uh, Franciscan used to uh, appoint some religious like knights of the Holy Sepulchre. Mm -hmm. So the beginning, historically thinking, is discussed, mm -hmm. but uh, the roots normally mm -hmm. are very deep in this ancient history. Although sometimes we don't know the roots really from the moment, from the place where they are. We normally used to see the tree and the, the fruits. Yeah. So historically, we leave it to the history to find and to, 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 to have there. But anyhow, we are in order which the Holy Father gave us the opportunity to say, in the moment in which the Ottoman Empire was going in crisis and uh, almost to collapse because many uh, nationalities inside, also uh, the Middle East was just in crisis. Yes. The Holy Father at the time, Pius IX, said, we want to restart with the Latin Patriarchate in Jerusalem, with a bishop, with a church, Latin church there. So he rebuilt the church, Latin church in Jerusalem, in the Holy Land, mm -hmm. and they gave to some, to our order, to become part as a church to become a part of this rebuilding, mm -hmm. financially helping this local church, which was poor, and getting the contribution of many in the world, 
This you understand knights, dames, so male and female, not only, uh, uh, not only uh, knights, to engage themselves and from their wealth condition to help this church. Yep. This is an important part of it. Um, the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre were very distinct from, say, the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar were there to protect pilgrims with swords and fighting. But the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre didn't do that, that their no. roots are in helping the Franciscans. Yes. yes. Franciscans from the time of St. Francis had custody of the Latin Christians in the Holy Land. The Muslims respected yes. St. Francis from tremendously. From 1217, St. Francis accepted to open the custody of Franciscan custody in the Holy Land. Yep. So we are at the beginning, during the period of St. Francis, the life of St. Francis from the beginning. And the two years later, so in 1218, St. Francis went to the Holy Land. Right. So it was the first uh, uh, trip done by him and to try to organize the custody, Franciscan custody in the Holy Land. This is something very new, in some way revolutionary. Mm -hmm. You think in this, in this period, crusades are very strong. Mm -hmm. And to get free, to free the Holy Land, they have to fight. Well, the revolution was that St. Francis said that we cannot go in the Holy Land just fighting. We have to go in the Holy Land with our simplicity, poverty, to take care of the place of where Jesus was born, where Jesus lived, where Jesus died, in a very simple matter. Not just fighting, but just try to get back these places and helping uh, these places to become uh, the place where Christians, pilgrims, used to go to pray. Right. So this is something new in the consider. From one part, it was to fight. The other part was a peaceful way to be in the Holy Land. And it reflects a change in some of the politics when the Crusades began in the 11th century. It was a group, it wasn't Arabs, it was Seljuk Turks that were causing trouble for Christian pilgrims. The Crusaders came and fought and so on. That's a different history. But by the time of St. Francis, things had changed quite a bit. It was, a, it was back to an Arab uh, kind of relationship and there was Another kind of ease in the, between Muslims and Christians with St. Francis leading the way. And I think that's important to note. But the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre were not those who were fighting for the Holy Land. They were there at service. And it's, there's a continuity between these early years of being there to serve the local uh, Christians and the pilgrims with various needs travelers would have and what is done today. Um, I'm very familiar having been to the Holy Land many, many times and I'm very familiar with the various good deeds and good works the knights are doing to help the churches and the local Christians, a very tiny minority now. Many have left the country over the last hundred years. Um, you know, the, a lot of trouble started in the 1920s 
between Arabs and Jewish people immigrating there. And Christians were in the middle. Um, where even now, there's a smaller group of Christians, maybe 1% of the population at this point. Used to be 27%. Now it's down to 1%, so it's quite small. But the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre continue to help and yes. serve the local church, yes. not with politics and fighting, yes. none, none, of that, none of that. It's about various other kinds of service. That brings me to your book. Yes. You know, there are two things I'd like to see us discuss in this book. One is the spirituality that you derive for the Knights, especially connected with the Holy Sepulchre. And secondly, that the faith that is the basis of the spiritual life also requires a charity that serves other people in need. This is one of the main things that I see. Yes. Would that be fair? Yes. Yes, of course, uh, of course. Uh, uh, I used to say, you know, a tripod, not only two legs, three legs. To be stable, you need a tripod. Yes. The first is spirituality of our order, knights and dames. Okay. If you don't have this spirituality, perhaps you have another congregation, another institution, a human institution with some uh, good aims, but is it something different from our point of view? Yep. So having a spirituality is like not only to have a body, to have a live body. So from, uh, if you take away uh, from our body, the life, you have a, a cadaver. You have a not yes. a, a human being. When you have a spirituality, it means life is there. Yeah. So to have this body, you need this spirituality. No. Then, like a body, you have to do something. You are not like an angel. You don't know what to do and not to do. So we think that. And this is the second leg, commitment to the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. What means commitment to the Holy Land? Helping the church there. I am thinking about Latin church in, in special mm -hmm. particular. Mm -hmm. And we assist the patriarchate, Latin patriarchate, to be there and to carry on the duty human, religious, spiritual, not only for the local church there, although they are a small group, but also for pilgrims, for all others. We are, are there like a seed. But you do also your activity among people. The people living in the Holy Land are Christians, Muslim, and if you too. Where they meet together? In the school. The children, they, each other, they go to school, where they can meet each other. If we help education, we are doing a very important job in co-educating the children to think that it's possible a, a peaceful coexistence mm -hmm. in this land. Not only education, but also charity assist. Uh, assistance. So many activities we have there for uh, the handicapped, for the poor, for those who are in need, without taking advantage of any religious system. So all of all of them there, they can get assistance. It's, uh, and I want to highlight that so people understand yes. that the charity done 
does not require a person to be a Christian. No. It does not require a non-Christian to get baptized. Exactly. That there, there are poor Jewish people, they can be helped. There are poor Muslim people, sure. they're helped. And there are the poor Christian people, they're helped. Catholic and it doesn't, Catholic. that's right. There are yes. many religious communities in the Holy Land. The Latin Christians are one, but there are more Greek Orthodox, and there are many other Oriental churches, uh, Maronites and uh, the Chaldeans, the Assyrians, uh, on and on, quite a few. Sure. And they all have very ancient rites yes. in the Holy Sepulchre Church, for instance, sure. but they also have great needs. Yes. And, so and the Knights are willing to help everybody. This is why charity is an inclusive charity, open charity. Yep. So this is the second. So I said the first, spirituality. The second, assistance to the church there. The third one is our order. Our members are working also for the local churches in which they are. It means they are diocese, parish, and so on. Mm -hmm. This is at the tree. Yep. They're still rooted in the church in, the local in America, churches. in yes. Europe, Africa, exactly. Asia, exactly. Latin America, exactly. everywhere. So now, when you put the first part of my book is spirituality linked especially to the last period of the life of Jesus, and especially the, the, the sufferings, the death and the resurrection. But on the same time, in the second part, I touch the question, ecclesiastical question. We, as an order, are part of the church. How we can connect ourselves to the church? Mm -hmm. And this is the so biblical and also ecclesiological part. Mm -hmm. These are the two aspects. Because the body of Jesus is not only something which we think about the past, the body of Jesus is alive, is present. Where Jesus lives today, yep. where he lives, in the church. So. so if we don't take care, this is the charity, this is the education. If you don't take care of the church here, today, now, so we are thinking only to the past, but we are connected also to the present. Well, you bring out very well that first, Every knight and dame of the Holy Sepulchre must be focused on the person of Jesus Christ. Yes. And that the two ways to do this that you talk about is, one, the Word of God is a living Word. He's the Word made flesh. Yes. He's a living Word. And the knights and dames must meet Jesus in yes. the Word, and then secondly, in the Holy Eucharist. Yes. These are two of the ways that that living person of Christ, and you bring out that you enter this yes. in baptism. Yes, yes. So many told me, we are impressed by the fact that uh, you told that we have to continue what Mary of Bethany did to Jesus. What happened? Jesus went to the house in Bethany of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And Mary was anointing the feet of Jesus with this perfume anointment. And uh, Jesus said, uh, very interesting, said that to answering to Judas, who was scandalized because uh, this very costly uh, uh, perfume was not uh, the, the money was not given to the poor, Jesus said. And, and just so, so folks understand the importance of that, yes. it was more than a year's worth of work. Yes. Somebody, a, an ordinary person, would have to work for more than a year, Yes. about a, a year and maybe uh, four months or so, in order to buy that perfume. Yes, of course. And that's, and that's what he saw the value of it in money. Yes, he saw in money. 
But Jesus said, let her to do it. It will be the last care she can give it to me. Yeah. But the poor, you will have always with you. Yep. So what you think to do in the past, you follow to do it, not to me. Mary did it. Yep. But you, as a church, you have to continue to do it with the poor and to the church itself. Yeah. So the body of Jesus still continue to be alive. We, as order of the Holy Sepulchre, we want to continue the same gesture of Mary. It means to take care of the body of the church today. So this is, this is our, you know, spiritual mission. It's also important to remember what St. John added, that Judas didn't really care about the poor. He was a thief, and he wanted his part of the money. It's important, because, and not in the very next chapter of John's Gospel, we see that he gets 30 pieces of silver um, to betray Jesus, that his focus on acquisition led him to betrayal. And there's a great line from the American Archbishop Fulton Sheen, who said that the cynic is someone who knows the price of everything <laughs> and the value of nothing. Now, we have to take a little break. Yes. I know you're ready to get started. <laughs> <laughs> but because we have to take a little break, okay. I want to, to have you hold that thought. Yes. We'll come back in uh, two minutes, and we'll continue on our conversation with Cardinal Fernando Poloni. So please stay with us. Welcome back. We are continuing our conversation in Rome at the Palace of the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre with the Grand Master of the Knights, Cardinal Fernando Filoni. And we're delighted to be with him. We were discussing before how that wonderful scene when Mary puts the expensive ointment on the feet of Jesus. And he tells the disciples, especially Judas, you'll always have the poor with you. And the knights see themselves as continuing on that service, that you're pouring this ointment on the poor. You're trying to serve them. You were about to then speak to this issue. Please continue. Yes. Uh, when we read this uh, part of the Gospel of St. John's Gospel, you see, uh, Judas was the man who started to complain because the ointment was so expensive and uh, you could sell this ointment and they give him back, they, 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 they all give him back, they give him to the, to the poor. Mm -hmm. Jesus never commented what Judah had in his mind. Jesus said, leave Mary to do it. And uh, this is, will be a touch will be the last as attention to my body. Mm -hmm. To the poor, you will take care later on. And if always, for always. The body of Jesus is the church. And in the church, you have two 
treasure. One is the Eucharist. So our spirituality is also Eucharistic spirituality. The second is uh, Pua. It means they will show you how much you need to take care in the future of this suffering humanity. I don't like when St. John commented. Judas was making this comment, it means that they cost it to give it to the poor because he was a thief. This is a bit uh, strong. Never Jesus commented that. St. John commented that mm -hmm. he was a thief. And he was just opening something which is closed. And it's better not to, to comment it. Normally, normally, Jesus never judged the intention. Never Jesus, Jesus uh, commented the intention of anyone. Neither the intention of a Judah, or Judas, who was a little bit tricky, no, comment. Then Jesus gave to us this uh, uh, attention for the mystical body. Not only for me. I don't need any more of any ointment with the resurrection, the body of Jesus. Does need any attention. But there is another body which take our attention. And this is a suffering body still now. The body of the church is a still suffering body. These suffering are coming, first of all, by unfaithful Christians, unfaithful priests, unfaithful person who are betraying their baptism, their vocation. So it is essential not only Jesus through the love for all, but through the penance to recover the suffering body and to give still today all attention. The sacraments are this ointment left to the church to continue to take care of the mystical body, the Eucharist, the penance, and all the other sacraments. So it is important to connect and not to see the body of Jesus as something in the past, <coughs> what he was, but to see all, also this mystical body. If we today, we don't love this mystical body, we don't take care of this mystical body, which is the church in all aspects. We lost an opportunity. We are just making, you know, remembrance of the past. Mm -mm. Yeah. And it's not too difficult to find ways you can serve the needs of the church. There are a wide variety of them, of course, there is the physical care for the poor, but there is also that kind of bringing comfort. In the modern world, part of the heartache of the lack of faith is seen in the widespread use of drugs that then kills people, the misuse of sexuality that some, too often leads to the killing of children in the womb and various other problems with the breakdown of the family. And people are lonely in the face of that misuse. Things that the world has told us, we need to have a sexual revolution, a drug revolution, and they are as catastrophic as the French Revolution was in its day, or the Russian Revolution. And the church has to say, see, we told you so. No, we have to go there. What is the hurt 
that leads you to use drugs, to misuse your, your emotions, your sexuality, destroy your families. How can we reach out to meet people in those situations? This is the ointment yes. we have to put in there. Yes. Well, I think uh, I was a prefect of the congregation for the evangelization of people. I visited more than 50 countries, mm -hmm. sometimes very poor, very poor countries. When I saw missionary activities here and there, among the most poor, among the all people, in the education, sometimes people with a lot of children under the tree, educating the children how to write, how to read, how to do, to stay, to say, or helping these very poor hospitals. Once I was uh, in Africa, and the sisters told me, let come and see uh, our uh, 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 orphanage. You see these 18 children, very, very small. These are taken, recovered by, uh, you know, dusty situation, horrible situation. Just people, uh, children thrown out by the families, abandoned. Yep. We take care. Sometimes the police bring it here. You know, taking care. This is the mission we are doing. The church can do this mission, helping the humanity to come out from drugs, yeah. from all these horrible things which are happening. Eating each other, killing female, men, everything doing, killing, shot, shooting, and so on. The church can do this yeah. job. Yeah. This is helping the body. It means helping the body of Jesus, like Mary of Bethany, taking care of it through the activities the church can do today. Yeah, yeah. And this is you know, a, a very important continuation of that scene from the last week of the life of Christ. You also spend a good deal of time reflecting on the meaning of the cross and of the tomb. Give us some of your reflections about what is the importance of the cross and the use of the tomb, and then Easter as well. You know, the cross, uh, it was a horrible, horrible system to kill people. Yep. The Latin used to say is the, mo the most horrible system. Now, Jesus accepted to die on the cross and then make a revolution. From the moment he took the cross, the cross became, from an instrument of a torture, of a killing, became an instrument of a peaceful way of reconciliating man and God. Jesus accepted as a gift for his life, the cross. Then on the cross he offered his life in his hands, Father, I am putting now. So the cross ended to be an instrument of torture and it became an instrument of salvation. Mm -hmm. This is something we have to reflect. Because uh, humanly thinking, you cannot accept it. But uh, spiritually, morally, and uh, what Jesus said, it means the nature of the cross changed. From torture became glorious. In the church, we believe that the cross is an instrument, glorious instrument of salvation. The same is the tomb. It's the place where normally you put people to die. That is finished. If you read the Exodus, there is uh, something very interesting. When Moses went to Sinai, called by God, he was terrified by the 
phenomenology which happened there, terrorized by what? The, 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 the presence of God. So he tried to hide himself in a rock. It is interesting, it's written, and the God put like a hand on Moses, not to be destroyed by the glory of a God passing through. Yes. This is what happened in the Holy Sepulchre. Jesus saw the glory of God in the sepulchre. He was like in a rock, in the womb, the second womb in which he stayed, first of Mary. The second is the womb of the earth. So the sepulchre is just like with the stone close over, like hand from where he came out like Moses, glorious, and the Exodus, the liberal of Exodus say, people could not look to Moses because he was radius. Jesus, when he came out from the sepulchre, the resurrection, people said he was glorious. Yeah. You see the cross instruments of a torture to kill people in the worst way. The sepulchre is the place where everything is finished, now closed. Both of them, one changed the nature, became a glorious instrument of salvation, the other became the empty tomb from where the life came out again. And when you describe it in your book, you mention that when the women and later on Peter and John went into the tomb, Peter, John especially noticed the burial cloths were folded. The cloth on his head was folded neatly. It was not a scene of chaos. No. It was order. Yes. Yes. Yes, of course, uh, if you go to steal the body, <laughs> you take the body. <laughs> not the neck, the body. You take the body with everything just yeah. to hide. No, it was that, not that. Jesus received the life from the Father. It was a new life, a different life, an uh, altered life. And in that moment, in that moment, we know that Everything Jesus said, everything he did, come from God. If Jesus was not risen, everything he said, he did, perhaps was, were acts of a philosopher. No one uh, spoke like him. No. Could be like very extraordinary man, he did extraordinary, but was not linked to the faith. The faith, it means link man to God, became full in the moment in which Jesus is risen. Everything the past was full of something new. From that moment, everything will come in the church, in the life of the apostle, will become something completely new. And again, as I was reading your book, I did so with vivid images in my mind of these holy places. And one of the points you develop is the meeting of Jesus with Clopas and his companion on the way to Amos, to Emmaus. Uh, we know that there's a wonderful church to commemorate that meeting uh, in a village just a short way outside Jerusalem. Not always easy to get to because of t political troubles, but <laughs> when you can, it's, it's a wonderful site to visit. Tell us uh, some of your own reflections on 
Jesus meeting the two disciples on the way to Emmaus? Well, this is uh, concerning my point of view, is a very beautiful catechesis. Yeah. Who are these two men? We are the two men. With our disillusion, with our experience in the life, with our, uh, you know, doubts, we go on, we go through a village. No, like the two. We are going towards something. If you don't find Jesus, if Jesus will not come to, to touch you, your life is passing, going through, and you don't know. It's ending and it's finished. When Jesus, for the first time, went to them together, not just uh, trying to do something exceptional, mm -hmm. but just to talk to them, mm -hmm. to have a dialogue, to take from their heart their disillusion, their problems, their difficulties. And this is, uh, the Jesus started to put a light on that. From that moment, the two men started to recover hope. They recognized Jesus in the moment in which Jesus revealed himself in the fraction of the bread. We need in our life to have this experience because the two men are myself and you. We need an experience in which our doubts and problems must be enlightened by the word of Jesus. Mm -hmm. We need to meet him, so in our experience, and to recognize him from, not from something exceptional, but from the light, from our life, which is enlightened by Jesus itself. Mm -hmm. If we don't have this experience, we finish, we end our life, and we ask each other, I am old man, what I did. Everything is ending, why? For what? Problems, difficulties, everything could happen. There is a, in the gospel a very special key words. St. Paul, in the letters to uh, the Galatians said that he had a, a thorn in his body and he was suffering a lot and many times like autobiography he said many times I asked God why why do you don't take from me this thorn mm -hmm. And always Jesus told to me, I never will, will take away from you this thought. It is enough, my grace. This is the enlightenment. And the St. Paul said, from this I knew that God was near to me, accompany me. In our life, we have to think never. Sometimes God will give, we, we, we leave us some thorns for our conversion, for the needs we have for spiritual. If we don't have this thorn, which is sometimes is torturing our life, what means? Sometimes a, 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 a child or a body, a, a, a son, a daughter, with the drugs, sometimes making horrible things. Sometimes these tones are making our lives very suffering. Sure. If you don't have the grace of God, you will die for that. But if you have the grace of God, you believe the grace of God will accompany you also with these tones, you will see the end. The two disciples recognized Jesus at the end of their journey. 
And they went back to say, now we are happy. Jesus is with us. He's not a dead man. He's not finished. He's alive. He's in, among us, between us. Yeah, and that, that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul talks about that. And, yeah, sure, sure. And one of the things that you are bringing out uh, throughout, the, throughout the book is the importance of making these connections for, of the scripture, the teaching of Jesus, the way he taught the disciples to Emmaus, the way he met the women after the empty tomb. Um, you, you bring that out as key to the spirituality of the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre. And we have only another minute and a half, two minutes. But I was also you know, uplifted by at the end of the book, you talked about the importance of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Yes. Mary at the cross, Mary during the life of Jesus, and how she becomes our mother in that order of faith. In our last minute and a half or so, tell us a little bit about that aspect as well, why it's so important. Yes, Mary was given to the church. It means to John, then from John, to the apostles, the church beginning. She was among them. It is interesting in the, in the, in the in Arabic mind, in the Middle East mind, a woman never must be alone. Yep. Always must be accompanied by somebody. So the last moment in which Jesus said, now, my mother, I have to entrust it to somebody, gave it to St. John. Then John brought her to the apostles. She now has a new family. Never she abandoned this family. This is a new family in which she still alive, st lives with us. So thinking that Our Lady never abandoned this living body, mystical body, which is the church, we have to think that Our Lady is still accompanying Jesus, like, uh, like in the past when Jesus was alive, accompanying him during his life from the beginning until the end, still he will, she will accompany the church, the new body of Jesus until the end. She will be always with us. And there's that sense, you know, in Middle Eastern culture, when there's an older woman mm. who has been entrusted to, it's not just her natural children that will call her mother. The other people will too, yaum. <laughs> you know, this is, uh, and when you see it, um, even you see a man on the street, you don't know, you, you call him yaach you know, and the, 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 or the, the or uncle, you know. So that sense has continued on to the present. Uh, many of the Arabic hymns, you know, Ya Allah, you know, that it's addressing to her as, as mother. And we in the Western church do yes. the same. Eminence, uh, we are running quickly out of time, too quickly. I want to thank you for writing this book. Uh, it's for those who are interested, whether you're a Knight of the Holy Sepulchre or not, it's called The House Was Filled with the Fragrance of the Perfume by Cardinal Fernando Filoni. Eminence, thank you for writing this. Thank you for continuing the service of the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre. And could we quickly receive your blessing? Yes. May God bless you, brothers and sisters, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Be Amen. with God in peace. Thank you Amen. very much. And may your ministry continue on in peace as well. Thank you. Thank you. And thank all of you for being with us tonight. Thank you.